Today I'll tell you about my most frequently used camera as of late while sipping a Gimlet. Hello and welcome to another installment of Behind the Glass with a Glass. I'm Nick Carver and the world is on lockdown. A lot of people are holed up in their tiny apartments, not allowed to go outside. Uh, it's tough times. And I don't know about you, but what helps me get through tough times is a little bit of sippy sip. A little drinky drink. Not too much, of course. Just enough to take the edge off. Mm. I can feel that edge coming right off. So, what I'm drinking here is a gimlet. I'm going to tell you about that today. I'm also going to tell you about this camera here. My Mamiya 645 Pro TL, which happens to be, I think, my most frequently used camera in recent months, um, and I'll tell you why as we go through it. But first, let me tell you about the drink. So this is a cocktail, of course. It's a mixed drink, um, gin-based. And uh, a gimlet is composed of, I'm, I'm going to use ounces here, but if you prefer the metric system, I'm sure you can work out the ratios. So it's two ounce gin, half ounce simple syrup, half ounce lime juice, thrown into a uh, cocktail shaker with a bunch of ice, shake it up real good, and pour it out into a glass. Now you can serve it up like I have here, or you can serve it over the rocks. And if you want to go real fancy, get yourself a coupe glass. That's what this is here. So if you want to score some points with your upper crust friends, pour it up into a coupe glass. Hmm. Now, I know uh, supplies may be limited in your neck of the woods, so we can tweak the recipe a little bit if you don't have all these ingredients. First off, let's say you don't have simple syrup, no problem, it's optional anyway. Won't be quite as sweet, but it'll still be good. Um, and also, you can actually make simple syrup at home, uh, just with sugar and water. Uh, just look up online how to do it. It's, it's quite easy from what I can see. Uh, and if you don't have lime juice, no big deal. Lemon juice will work well. Uh, it's not quite as good as lime in my opinion, but it's just about as good using lemon juice. And then if you don't have gin, use vodka, baby. Let's roll with it. Let's make jazz here. We gotta improvise a little bit. Um, but a classic gimlet, two ounce gin, half ounce simple syrup, half ounce lime. That's how I prefer it. Um, now, I want to give you a little history of this drink, because it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. So this was popular amongst British naval officers. Um, it may have been served to them as far back as the 19th century. So it was a way to get lime juice into the sailors to prevent scurvy. So vitamin C deficiencies, lime juice was a good way to, uh, to prevent that. But apparently, straight lime juice ain't quite palatable. But if you mix some gin in with it, it uh, tastes a lot better. By the way, I'm using a Bombay Sapphire gin here, but just about any gin will work fine. Um, so really, it was a means to uh, prevent scurvy. So really, it's a healthy drink. That's, that's what I'm getting from that. Rear Admiral Sir Thomas Desmond Gimlet. If that ain't a British name, I don't know what is. Rear Admiral Sir Thomas Desmond Gimlet, uh, who, quote, Acting as a doctor to sailors, he administered gin with lime in order to mask the bitter taste. So he may have been the one who, who kind of invented it. But I've been enjoying these um, a few nights out of the week as we go through this difficult time in the Earth's history. Um, so get out there and enjoy yourself a gimlet. Okay, let me tell you about this camera. So, I bought this Mamiya 645 Pro TL a couple years ago off of eBay because I was looking for a camera that was medium format, it was an SLR, and it wasn't huge. So, like, I have an RZ67, which is, if, you, if you've seen my videos, you know um, I really like that camera, but it's just so damn big. It's really hard to travel with, it's hard to have it hang around your neck on it for a long photo shoot. So I wanted something a little smaller. Uh, my main motivation was I wanted something that I could keep on the, on the passenger seat of my car when I'm doing off-roading and camping, all that kind of stuff, that I could just grab and run out and do quick photos when I stumble upon something that's real interesting. 
So it's kind of my, my grab and go camera. And it's about as small as I could get it without it being a, a rangefinder. And I generally prefer SLR cameras because it allows me to be much more precise with my compositions. So it needed to be an SLR, but it needed to be relatively small. This was the, uh, the best um, fit I could find for that. Also, it's a Mamiya, and I love Mamiya designs. Uh, my RZ67 has a lot of things about it that make it easy to use. This uh, carries on that, that design tradition. It's, it's a camera that gets out of my way and really helps me get to the photo with uh, minimal barriers. Um, I like to keep it in this uh, Tenba messenger bag. Um, so I keep it in there with its extra lens and a few rolls of film and an assortment of filters. And uh, that's like my grab and go bag. So the 645 Pro TL is part of Mamiya's uh, 645 series. It started off with the 645 Super and then that was replaced by the 645 Pro. Uh, so no TL yet, just the 645 Pro. And then the 645 Pro was eventually replaced with the 645 Pro TL, which almost identical to the 645 Pro, just added the TL, which the TL part uh, is representing the fact that it added TTL flash metering. This was eventually replaced with the 645E, which was introduced in, in the year 2000. But the 645E was actually a stripped down version from this system. Uh, it had a fixed, prism, fixed viewfinder, uh, a fixed film back. So it was kind of a stripped down version of this and then they stopped making them. It, that was around the time film started to uh, go the way of the dodo anyway. My particular version, the TL wasn't introduced till 1997. So at the very oldest, mine is from 1997. But I think it's quite a bit newer than that because it's in real good shape. Um, one thing that's kind of, kind, of, uh, kind of cool is in 2008, they ran a small production of the 645 Pro TL, but in these like wild colors. Really cool stuff. Um, I don't really know why they did it because it was 2008, film was kind of already on its way out and they weren't really making a whole lot of new film cameras around that time, but I guess they felt the need to put out this special edition uh, multicolored 645 Pro TL. Um, I love the white one. I think it's so cool looking. Um, if they weren't like $7,000 on eBay, ooh, I'd snatch up one of those babies. They're so cool looking. Um, I also really like the yellow and the baby blue. They kind of look like diver's gear. You know, the yellow on black and the baby blue on black. Um, cool looking cameras, man. Um, I'll just have to deal with the boring old black until, until I can afford a you know, $7,000 645 Pro TL. Um, now I bought mine a couple years ago uh, it didn't come with the auto winder. I'll talk about that in a sec. It just came with a crank, uh, so manual film advance. And it came with the AE prism finder, really great thing I'll, I'll tell you about, and a waist level finder, and uh, an 80 millimeter 1.9 lens. So that's quite a bit in a kit. And a couple years ago, I got that for $620. Nowadays, those are going for $700 to $1,000 with a lens. And if it has the auto winder, of course, it's uh, at the upper end of that. So I got a pretty good deal. Um, so I'll show you some pictures that I've taken on this. Now, before I do, by the way, as I mentioned, this is one of my most used cameras lately, and yet you've never seen it in any of my on-location videos, um, which I know might seem odd. And that's because given the fact that it is my kind of run-and-gun uh, camera, I don't tend to bring it on like planned photo shoots where I'm gonna be doing an on-location video. The on-location videos, I tend to do more of my uh, 4x5, 6x17, 6x7 with the RZ, um, kind of the more slowed down, um, thought through photos. The footage you're looking at right now was taken from my online course all about uh, light metering. So I did do a demonstration on how to use the light meter in this camera on, on that course, and it does have a great light meter that I'll be talking about in a minute. But anyway, uh, let me show you some pictures. So I've used this camera a lot for my uh, Dead Inside series, which I talked about in my last video. Um, shot some black and white with it as well. And um, a lot of pictures that you've probably seen before in previous videos where I've talked about image reviews. So I generally share the pictures from this camera. I just don't show myself using it a whole lot, um, which actually goes to show that I generally take photos with this camera that I really like. Um, you know, they say the best camera is the one that's with you. This is the one I tend to bring with me and maybe that's why it's the best camera. But also, I just really enjoy using it. It gets out of my way. 
It has the tools that I need and nothing extra. Um, and it's got the tools where I want them. It's very easy to control. It's, it feels like controlling a more modern camera, um, modern film camera, where, you know, I got some electrical features. I got a built-in meter. I don't have to do everything mechanically and manually. Um, things, the camera can help me out a bit but it didn't turn that corner where cameras started to get super complicated. Like when, once we hit digital, cameras just got more and more and more complicated and it's got too many buttons and things are getting in the way. This is nice, stripped down, simple. It's got all the tools I need, nothing really I don't. Um, but there are some uh, kind of quirks about this camera that I wanna go through. Um, the first one being, uh, and this is a, a great quirk, I guess you could say, it has a lot of accessories like a lot of ways you can customize the camera. So the way I have it right now is I have the, the AE Prism Finder with a 55 millimeter lens and a, and a power winder, an auto winder. Um, but they had different finders available. Um, first off, you could trade out the uh, Prism Finder for a waist level finder. If you wanna go with something a little more compact, uh, you lose um, auto exposure capability of course, because that's built into the, uh, the prism finder, but you can shoot a little more incognito. Um, it has a built-in magnifier, just like on my RZ67. You know, this whole thing, when it's in this uh, configuration, is actually kind of cute. It just looks like a smaller version of my RZ67, like the RZ67 had a kid, and here it is, the 645 Pro TL. Um, so you got that uh, stove pipe waist level finder that collapses. Um, they also had different uh, AE prism finders and non AE prism finders. So they had prism finders with no metering built in. Uh, they had pr other prism finders with metering built in, but they were kind of shaped differently. They're more angular. They had a tube coming out the back. Some had built in diopter adjustments. I don't know why they had so many variations because a lot of them aren't that different from each other, but I guess they were just making minor increments uh, to improve it. Um, so lots of uh, finders available. This one I have here is the FE401 finder. So it has uh, three different metering modes. It's got exposure compensation on the top and it's a relatively new model. It's got that kind of smooth rounded edge uh, design. Um, there's also several, di several different film backs. You know, of course the film back itself can come off the camera and within that you have your 120 insert. And you can also get a 220 insert there's also a 35 millimeter back, so you can actually shoot 130, 135 film uh, on this system with a panoramic option. So that's kind of cool. You can actually shoot like a 35 millimeter panoramic on this camera. Um, and of course, there's a Polaroid back as well. There's also several different uh, winders and grips available. So like right now, I have the power uh, winder grip. Um, mine is the WG402. There's also a WG401, which uses AA batteries instead of the 2CR5 battery that mine uses. So mine has this 2CR5 battery, and these are a little hard to, hard to find. You're not really gonna find this at Target. You're gonna have to go to a, a specialty battery store or um, order it online. So the uh, WG401 might be more convenient, just the fact that it's AA's. Some of them are a little boxier, some are wider, some are narrower. Like again, there's kind of a lot of, uh, of options when it comes to the, the uh, winder grip. They even have a left-hand grip. So they have a grip that's on the left, you're a lefty. Uh, this camera might be easier to use because you can put your hand on the left and still trigger the camera. Um, and then of course, there's a manual crank option. So uh, I bought this um, power winder separately. I bought this from keh.com, uh, but it came with this uh, crank winder, you know, with the, uh, the uh, waist level finder and a manual crank, you can shoot a little more quietly and you can shoot a little more, um, you know, under the radar. And that's one thing I really like about it. Like I can really switch the camera up to suit the environment I'm gonna be shooting in or suit the subject I'm gonna be shooting in. So it's a cool system, very modular. Um, in fact, if you tear the whole thing down, so I'll just take off all the accessory components here. Um, so, you know, the winder, the AE Prism Finder. Everything is very easy and modular and clicks in nice, good solid design. But when you get down to it, that's the camera. Tiny, tiny little camera, super lightweight. It's just, um, everything gets tacked onto it however you like. Um, prism Finder, Waist Level Finder, whatever. 
So it's a cool system. And for an SLR 645, it's actually pretty small, um, especially compared to like the Hasselblad uh, H6D that I covered in a previous Behind the Glass with the Glass. This thing is just way smaller. It's actually technically shooting the same format, uh, albeit film, not digital. Now, uh, some personal favorite features I want to show, uh, show to you. Um, first off, it has great auto exposure, great AE. Um, the meter in there is nice, it's reliable, uh, it's consistent. And um, there's three different metering modes. You have spot metering, of course. You have average metering, so if you want to read the entire scene. And then you have auto A-S, and this is something I've only ever seen in Mamiya cameras. Uh, my RZ has it as well. But that's a mode where it will automatically switch between average metering or spot metering depending on the scene. So basically the way it works is it tries, it, it reads the scene, and if it notices that the center of your image is drastically different in brightness from the rest of the image, it switches to spot metering. Um, so it's kind of interesting. It's basically trying to determine if your subject is backlit. And if it is, because it sensed that the center is so much darker than the rest, it says, oh, it must be backlit. Let's go to spot metering so we're only honing in on the middle. Kind of a cool feature if you're doing this in um, aperture priority mode or something like that, that could, be, uh, that could be useful. It has a plus three to minus three exposure compensation. So if you're shooting in, again, aperture priority mode, um, that could be used to sway the exposure brighter or darker. Um, the only two modes on this are manual or aperture priority. You have A for aperture priority mode, and then you have AEL for auto exposure lock, which is the exact same as aperture priority mode, except that when you press halfway down, it locks the exposure. Um, so that's kind of like the AEL button on the back of your Canon or Nikon. Um, so simple, the dials are all very easy to find. They're all on the top. So when you, you know, look at the top of the camera, everything is accessible. You're not doing a lot of back and forth looking at the top and the back of the camera. Um, it's all in very logical places. Um, the, the ability to strip it down to a lighter system is probably my favorite feature about it, just that it's so customizable and can be adjusted for any, any uh, scenario. Um, one thing that's kind of cool if you do the hand crank, the hand crank can actually be positioned in several different angles. I think there's like six different positions you can put the hand crank in. So if you're used to cranking with it at the front and then ending at the front, you can do that. If you're used to it starting in the back and ending in the back, you can do that as well. The crank can be positioned to uh, any angle you want. It seems like an odd thing to point out, but one thing I do like is the auto winder has a lock position uh, switch just below the, the shutter release. So this switch here serves only one purpose. It just disables the shutter release button. And I really like that because what I do is when it's hanging around my neck, I take my picture and then just what I've been thinking about it, I just switch it to lock, um, which is actually the other, other way. So I switch it to lock and then I know I'm not going to accidentally bump it and waste a frame. Um, it has depth of field preview, but it's on the lens. It just has a switch. If you put it from A to M, then the aperture will actually close to whatever position you've chosen. So that's for depth of field preview. Um, mirror lockup is kind of cool. It's just a mechanical switch. So it's not electronic or anything like on a new system. It's this switch literally just flips up the, the mirror uh, manually. You can actually feel the resistance in there when you do it. The shutter release button on the camera has a lock position as well, and it also has a 10 second timer. So if you need to do some selfies with this bad boy, no problem. Just put it on that 10 second timer. Um, one quirk about it that I really like, and this is a perfect example of why I love Mamiya designs. Like they just think things through. The viewfinder has a, uh, a shield, it has a curtain. Just like my, my Canon EOS 1V, and a lot of modern digital cameras have that. Just a little switch to block the viewfinder in case you're doing ultra long exposures, you don't get any light leak coming in through the viewfinder. But one thing that's really cool about the Mamiya is it's red. I know this sounds like such a stupid small thing, but think about it. You're in some environment doing a super long exposure. That means it's a dark environment. That means your eyes are having a hard time seeing a lot of this black camera. Every camera I have, that shutter or, or that viewfinder shield is always black. So then you can't tell if it's closed. I've done it a couple times where I pull up my EOS 1V and I'm like, what the? Oh, the thing's closed. But because this has a red uh, shield, I can see so clearly that it's closed. Um, those little attention to details, um, I like a lot on the Mamiya's. 
some weird quirks that um, are just kind of odd, not really good or bad, but uh, it doesn't have a position for a standard cable release. So you can't just do the screw in type cable release. You actually have to get an adapter, which I got this from K KEH as well. It plugs into the electronic cable release and then you can use a mechanical cable release on the, uh, on the camera. Uh, and it locks in really good. It's actually a very, very tight uh, connection. Um, the waist level finder, one thing that was always confusing to me until recently, you can put the waist level finder on but not pull up the, uh, the stove pipe. You can just pull up these little guides here. And it's almost like gun sights. So you look through one small rectangle and then there's a bigger rectangle. This was always confusing to me because I didn't understand how that would work. One rectangle and a big rectangle doesn't mean anything to me. But then I looked online. There's a, uh, a plexiglass insert that's supposed to go here. Mine doesn't have it. Um, that has different square uh, rectangles and you're supposed to line those up and that'll tell you um, what focal length you're shooting at. So if you want to shoot uh, even quicker than looking down into a viewfinder, that little gun sight option is kind of cool. And then finally, just because I always find these kind of funny, um, dedicated buttons to check the battery. Uh, BC, right down here, you press that. If this light lights up solid red, the battery is sufficiently charged. Uh, if it blinks, then you should change it soon. Um, I always find that funny. I don't know why. Every time I see a camera where there is a dedicated button taking up space on the camera just so you can see if the battery is good, um, I always think, couldn't they come up with a better way to do that just by pressing like halfway down and checking the battery or something? Um, I know, weird stuff that fascinates me. But anyway, that's the Mamiya 645 Pro TL. Uh, I'm sure glad I invested in this camera because it's served me well so far and I think it'll serve me well for many photo shoots to come. But consider making yourself a gimlet. If you don't have the ingredients perfect, just do the best with what you got. And uh, keep taking that edge off till we get through these tough times. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you.